Well, we read it. And then we take this rewritable tag. This is called a Q2. Put that on there. Takes a little longer, but now it's cloned. OK, you know, doesn't let us in. That's fine. Now, if we take this valid key, which we can see does let us in, we can read that. Takes just a second. We can clone it. And now we're in. <laughs> so I see there's really no reason this couldn't be installed, I don't know, let's say in a bus bench or, you know, Starbucks <laughs> that day traders, uh, you know, like to hang out in or whatever. Uh, so, you know, if it can be read, if it can be read, I, I believe it can be cloned. You know, you should operate without assumption. Uh, and then this wiring, obviously along the way, this is just very small gauge, you know, 22 gauge wire, something like that. These aren't much pushing a lot of current. And it, it doesn't take a lot to, you know, you have to be very diligent about protecting this stuff. Kind of interesting. Uh, we don't have all the alarm outputs and everything hooked up to this, but uh, you can easily put four different zones of alarm uh, sensors in. And uh, you can expand that more with shift registers or resistors or, or different other ways of doing it. We do have four open pins for Ethernet or, or additional you know, sensor stuff. So just a little bit about that stuff. Uh, while we've been doing that, we also have been logging this. So this is our serial logging. Uh, it's really simple. You know, it's just uh, 57 kilobit uh, serial over USB. And we can send that into a Linux log host that tails the logs. We have some scripts uh, written up that are published. Uh, let you do things like pipe that to an alerting system uh, or email or SMS you when someone comes or goes or an alarm happens. Uh, really basic, but it uh, gives you the capability of directly internet monitoring or via cell phone or modem uh, what you have. And we have those four relays, only two of which are used for the door. So one of those can easily go into our alarm system as well and trigger the alarm monitoring company. So just the, the last thing. Um, you know, again, we have uh, our physical exploits. Uh, we have the capability of, you know, potentially manipulating the wiring, doing horrible things with the data in transit, uh, you know, intercepting it, replaying it. We can do denial of service in a number of ways with these things. Uh, the contactless readers, in some ways, are better because we can put all of our reading behind the glass or inside our perimeter. But we have, you know, obviously new problems with being able to intercept it out of people's pockets and lunch boxes. <laughs> so if you uh, are curious about you know, the, the engineering behind that and you know, how you can predict how much range you can get and how much power, we, I actually was able to find one engineering textbook in RFID that's uh, on here. Uh, it's our third entry down, this RFID handbook. It's translated from German, so it's a little bit weird. But uh, it gives you a lot of interesting info. And uh, I highly recommend this book, uh, Security Engineering by Ross Anderson. This really has everything from physical security to building secure embedded systems to uh, secure networking. Pretty neat stuff. And uh, the last book on the bottom, uh, there's some interesting uh, projects in there that you can implement as just a hobby hacker type uh, RFID toys. Uh, this guy, Amal Grafstra, actually implanted an EM4100 chip in his hand and wired up everything from his car to his house to open from that. So there's someone who's been living on it. Pretty interesting. And uh, we have a few good links, too. The protocols for some of the stuff are published. Uh, the man in the middle attack that I mentioned, uh, that's Zach Franken, DEF CON 15, and Layer 1 2007. Uh, we have uh, you know, some of these documents from the CSAA, and uh, it's basically an ANSI working group, and some other stuff about smart card uh, you know, vulnerabilities, and uh, some other interesting stuff about just threat assessment in general. Uh, the last thing, we can download the code. Everything, the Eagle files, the design, the Arduino source code, it's all right there uh, at that Google code link. And uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Logging keyed access. Logging keyed access. So that's kind of problematic. The best you can do is log that the door opened a certain time. Some of the door hardware has a specific sensor inside that is tripped in the event of a key physically turning it. Uh, but that's, not some, that's something that depends on the mechanicals. Uh, you know, really the only reliable thing is determining the state of the door or the state of a motion detector outside of it. We call that a request to exit if it's on the inside, and that generally is logged in most of the alarm systems. 
uh, where they are, are actually correlating you know, someone tripping that sensor with a, a request to exit. But they'll let you out regardless of whether you trip that sensor. Uh, anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, integrating with the, you know, the alarm system, have you found any, let's say in residential, commercial, any legal issues with that or any insurance issues or things with integrating with, like, say, ADT or something like that? Is there hardware even capable of being integrated with easily? To so, alert? yeah, the easiest way to make that happen is to basically ask for a dry contact loop. Uh, most of the alarm vendors are okay with giving you an on-off contact that, you know, turning that on or breaking that connection will trip the alarm. People use that for things like, uh, let's say, monitoring their freezer if you have a grocery store. You know, you want the alarm to go off if the freezer quits working so that you don't lose $10,000 worth of seafood. Uh, and you can get it for, you know, like the, a sensor that de you know, detects if your basement is flooded. So generally, they're friendly with that. I don't think they care so much what's on the other end as long as it doesn't put high voltage in or screw up their system. Uh, that's what I found. It's a pretty common thing, then. Yeah, it's a pretty common uh, thing you can request. Uh, the smaller systems may not have enough zones or, you know, the, the systems they give you for free, I wouldn't count on it. But any quality system installed by a pro should be ha able to do that. Most of them have a panic button control. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, you can do that, too. The stupidest panic control, and you just tie into that. Okay. I have one more question. Yeah. You talk about, you know, hacking some of the, like, this, uh, the keypad locks and stuff like that that are yeah. electronic. How, how successful has that been? Is that kind of, you know, hit and miss, or has it been repeated a few times? And you know? Well, so the, the one we're working on currently is the Hirsch Electronics Scramble Pad. Uh, those are available all over eBay, and they're cheap, because they only operate with, guess what, Hirsch Electronics base stations. So we managed to find a rebuilt uh, bare circuit board. That's really the only time you're going to have success, uh, I think, decoding one of those. That particular one had a... Uh, a one-time programmable Intel 8051 CPU that with all the, fu the fuses blown so you can't dump the ROM out of it. And it's dead silent until you hook up to this device that uh, sends a 300 hertz uh, pulsing square wave along with some wide pulses here and there for about five seconds and a little green light comes on telling you it's working. So not a secure protocol, but an obscure protocol. And something like a logic analyzer, uh, like the Analogic project from Null Space will, can help you decode that. Now that one also is a little bit unfortunate to decode because uh, it's a 24 volt uh, plus 12 minus 12 signal. So we also need to uh, build some, you know, the voltage divider or, or some protection so that you don't blow up the logic analyzer. Uh, but that one we think is doable. Uh, some of the other ones that have a real, you know, security challenge response protocol, those might not be so so easy. But I think they're all within range of hackability. So does everyone want to put a you know hid system in in their in their apartment or their garage now? I mean, it's totally doable. It's it's within range. How much time did you spend on this? About half an hour total. Are you gonna sell the boards that you guys made? Good question. Yeah, uh, we actually uh, ordered about a dozen boards, and we have uh, spares and some kits available. So uh, we've been selling those at the 23B shop. Um, we'll be there you know Sunday. Uh, we, we'll have some. So we've been selling those for 100 bucks shipped, and we'll uh, we'll sell those for 80 bucks to anyone who attended uh, layer one. Awesome. <laughs> Anybody else? And that's just board, right? Got it. But no, no, that's the the board and all the components. The readers too? No, oh, uh, right. that would be the board, all the components to stuff the board. Right. Uh, no Arduino, no um, readers. Uh, the readers are available all over you know, eBay uh, from a lot of China vendors, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Uh, they're going to sell for between $20 and $50 each. Uh, there's a, actually a nice little one. Uh, it was in the version 1.0. That one will, will get you both a pin pad and an indoor reader, and it's like 16 bucks plus shipping. It's, it's dirt cheap. Uh, yes, we do. So there, uh, there's a wiki at the Google Code link. And that will show you, yeah, that reader right there, it's like 16 bucks if you see it, it's totally good. Uh, but the, uh, the wiki has a lot of stuff on wiring and debugging and building the thing. And uh, you know, we did find some other uh, you know, information that was interesting. Uh, all of the Import Asia readers work fine in our, you know, when we started deploying these, a couple other spaces have them. Uh, but some of the expensive commercial brands like HID didn't work reliably. 
And we discovered they send faster pulses and might be a little bit under spec for what you know we had uh, we had thought we'd have. Uh, that the standard isn't isn't always published. So we figured out there's some workarounds. You can put a couple of capacitors on there, and pretty much any reader works just fine. Really, anything that speaks Wigand 26. If you just do uh, an eBay search for Wigand or W26, you'll find loads of compatible readers and tokens. Yes? The, the cloner that you demonstrated, is that uh, the Proxmark project that you were talking about? That is not a Proxmark. This is a much dumber single purpose device. And uh, what this does is it lets you simply uh, clone EM4100, 4102 tags. Uh, they're one of the, the cheaper industrial tags that's available, you know, open standards and, and cheap. Uh, but there's no reason that couldn't be done. Uh, one other follow-on piece of research, I don't know if anyone reads Hackaday, I know it's one or two people, right? Uh, I don't know if anyone saw the duct tape RFID tag, uh, but they, someone took uh, just a small eight pin Atmel CPU, I think it's uh, an AVR85, and they attached a couple of capacitors and a loop of wire and made a basically an RFID tag emulator. And we actually built one of these at the last minute uh, up at the shop last night, and we opened the front door with it after we cloned another tag onto it. So that one will do both the HID cards and uh, the EM4100, because they're very similar. They just use a little bit different encoding. So there's no reason I think that couldn't be extended to other types of cards. So that's why you want the best that have a pin as well. Exactly. Yeah, a pin as well is not a bad idea. It's a second factor. Authentication with an or uh, integration with an alarm system that has nothing to do with it is another option. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, surveillance, you know, cameras that log off site. All of those, you know, represent defense in depth. Yes? Would uh, your system integrate into, I know some uh, security camera DVRs have alarm uh, ports on them as well. So could we integrate it into something like that so that it would do the motion detecting as well? So if it has uh, like a port for a motion detector, uh, that would be a dry contact and that would be easy to, to integrate. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, there might be other ways of doing it through software. I think we're just about at time. Uh, if there's anything else. And uh, these slides should be available online, uh, you know, probably right after the conference. No reason you can't. I'm just lazy.